Martin Freeman were doing to it and said, this can't go on. And he leaked it because he wanted the rest of the world to know. And one day he will be honored. But to make this, paint these people or Assange or WikiLeaks as if they're the problem, just think about it. It's grotesque. The problem is what, they are, what is in the reports that they are revealing in the policies of governments, and especially the United States government, which dominates the world today. So Obama, from that point of view, is an imperial president like any other. And the fact that he is of color, it's symbolic, as I said, but it doesn't go beyond that because you have to judge him on the basis of what he does. And none of the people who go on and on about this at length in the United States today did the same when Bush appointed senior people, African Americans, to his cabinet. Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, Secretary of State. Reagan appointed a former Black Panther radical, Clarence Thomas, to, the, to uh, a senior position, and later he was elevated to the Supreme Court. Now, I don't agree with the politics of these people at all, and that's the only criteria to judge them on. Otherwise, you lose sense, sight of uh, what is going on in that country, and identity becomes something so important that it transcends politics. People sometimes say, well, would it have been better if Hillary Clinton as a woman had been elected president of the United States? And I said, why? Why should it be better? She would have done the same things. And then people would have said, oh, well, it makes no difference, but we already know that. We've had some talented ladies in power, like Margaret Thatcher in Britain. <clears throat> like Golda Meir in Israel, like Indira Gandhi in India. I mean, you know, they've done some wonderful things, as you know. So we don't need any more lessons like that. We need different policies. The most striking absence of policies has been in the Middle East, where Obama went on his knees before the big <clears throat> Israeli lobby, even before he was elected, and pledged to them that Jerusalem would be the eternal capital of Israel, which is an illegal thing to say because it's not accepted by the UN and has never been said in so many words by any other US president. But he said it. He was totally incapable. Every American president who gets elected says the usual things. The Palestinians are victims, but they should behave themselves. Uh, there should be no more settlements built on Palestinian lands, and we will organize gatherings at Camp David and the White House to make sure by bringing both sides together. And then life goes on just as before. And the settlements that have been constructed on Palestinian land now are at such a level that there is no two-state solution possible. That's gone. It's dead in the water. And all the pressure that was put on the Palestinian PLO leadership to cave in, to capitulate, that too has been revealed in the Palestinian documents that have come out from Al Jazeera, not in this case from WikiLeaks. And you can now read the abject way in which the Palestinian leaders capitulated to the Israeli Defense Force. So that is a, continues to be <clears throat> a running sore. It's, it's not going to stop unless some, something happens, and the only decent thing that can happen one day, maybe not in the lifetimes of many of us, is a single state in which Jews and Christians and Muslims coexist and live, as historically Muslims and Jews have done in that region and in other parts of the world for a long, long, long time. <clears throat> I mean, if we were against apartheid in South Africa, and I remember many people said that could never be overthrown and got rid of, it finally was. And you had visionary politicians who sat down together and said, it's got to end. And it did. And there are many problems still, but at least that system has gone. And the similar thing needs to be done in the case of Israel. I mean, this is the sixth. No one threatens it and can threaten it anymore. It's the sixth largest army in the world. 
It has nuclear weapons. It has been sold the latest German submarines, which it has armed with nuclear weapons, and these submarines patrol the shores of the Arab and Muslim world nonstop. So who the hell is going to be mad enough to attack Israel now? That is not going to happen. This is not the 50s. This is 2011. And the Palestinians cannot be left in this condition. And the more extreme politicians in Israel are saying, well, maybe we should throw the Palestinians who are still within our borders out. Out where? And the way the United States kept this going was by creating a network of vassal states, regimes they back, dictatorial regimes, of which the two big ones were the Saudi, the Saudi monarchy, and the Mubarak dictatorship in Egypt. The Mubarak dictatorship was kept going with US money, billions each year, for 30 years. And it is not the case that they didn't know that the people hated this regime. Many of us pointed it out, their own people knew. And they finally waited till the people mobilized angered by what they saw and encouraged by the fact that the Tunisians had managed to do the same. And when they saw the, in Egypt that the Tunisians had managed to topple their dictator, my Egyptian friends tell me word went round in the streets of Cairo and Alexandria and Suez and Aswan saying, the Tunisians, who are the most soft-hearted, lotus-eating people in the Arab world, they can do it and we can't? What the hell is going on? And the number of demonstrators who poured out into the streets the week following the collapse of the Tunisian dictatorship took the entire world and the Egyptian dictatorship by surprise. They killed them, not a word, from the White House. Obama gave the State of, his union, his state of the Union message while the Egyptian Uprising was taking place. Not a word. Hillary Clinton interviewed, said, don't forget Mubarak has been one of our loyalist allies, and Bill and I used to regard him as family. <laughs> well, thank you very much, but you might have looked elsewhere. You might have adopted someone else. <laughs> so they were taken aback, taken by surprise. And they... I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's really horrific. A special envoy was sent to talk to Mubarak by Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State. Who was this guy? A former US ambassador to Egypt who had subsequently joined a huge PR company. And this PR company had the contract from the Egyptian government for doing its propaganda work in the United States. He is sent as a special envoy to talk to Mubarak. He arrives in Cairo, and the journalists say, have you arrived here to tell him to go? He says, no, I want him to stay. <laughs> Ultimately, they, they get a week's respite to see if they can crush it by force. And all over Egypt, 300 people are killed. The result, millions more come out onto the streets. Because when people lose their fear of death, then it's very difficult to stop them, really. And that fear of death disappeared in Egypt in those amazing weeks. And more and more poured out and said, you can kill us, we're not going to give up till this guy goes. And finally, he had to be dragged away, kicking and screaming. And then the new orderly transition that took place put the military in power who thought they could go on in the same old way. And they can't. Last week, the Egyptians demonstrated again and got rid of the prime minister. In Alexandria, people stormed the offices of the secret police and burnt it to the ground, including all the papers with files which had their names on it. In Tunisia, similar things carry on happening, and this whole democratic wave has now spread to the entire Arab world, and the Saudi king is tottering and saying to his people, we can give you how many billions, you know, two, three billions to just keep quiet. Because he knows, he knows that it's not going to stop. 
It's not going to stop. And in Libya, we're seeing an epic battle taking place to get rid of Gaddafi, who's killing and shooting and killing his soldiers who refuse to open fire on their own people. And this guy, for the last 20 years, was a close personal friend of Tony Blair, part and parcel of his government, pouring money into British educational institutions like the LSE. And the whole thing is now imploded in their face. And he's naturally saying, why I've given you so much money, why are you deserting me now? Because he is slightly mad <laughs> and doesn't fully grasp what's going on, but there is a method in his madness that he knows how to hang on to power. And that is what he's trying to do. So these developments that are taking place in the Arab world are putting more and more pressure on the United States, on Palestine, Israel. Don't forget that, because one of the big arguments we have been hearing for 10 years, the Arabs aren't interested in democracy. Muslims are genetically hostile to democracy. They don't really want it. Israel is the only democratic state in this heart of darkness that is the Arab world. Well, just look what's going around in that world. It is falling, it is crumbling, and the American administration doesn't know what to do. And this president behaves like any other president and defends what he thinks are American interests. And there are many realist political scientists in Chicago and Harvard who are saying he is not even capable of understanding what America's real interests are. So we are living in exciting times as far as some parts of the world are concerned. And this is going to force some rethinking in the United States and Europe, which follows them blindly everywhere. And the Arabs who are fighting today have to, be, have to be thanked for that, as are other people who are coming out. I, I can, I'll happily answer questions because, you know, the situation in Europe, Ireland collapsed, Iceland collapsed, Greeks collapsed and had to be bailed out. But the sticking plaster that they put on as part of the bailout is already showing, has been unable to stem the blood. You can see the blood coming out again now. Because they don't institute any basic changes. They want to carry on as before. And that, the economic crisis and the situation in the Middle East now makes impossible. Thank you. I'm sure you have uh, plenty of questions, so should we begin? Uh, where's our microphone? We got a microphone here? Just here. Yes. Thanks very much indeed. That was a wonderful analysis. What you seem to be saying is essentially it really doesn't matter who is the President of the United States. And I would agree. But on Saturday, you also, I think, were saying, or at least implying, that we can't have both neoliberalism and democracy. And I would agree. How do we get rid of neoliberalism? Well, this is what I am saying, that you have, <clears throat> at the moment, a neoliberal economic system, which was agreed to by the European and American elites and the rest of the world. Uh, some of them unwillingly, but it was imposed on them, and this system has now crashed. And when a system crashes, you know, you have to have a serious discussion on why it crashed and what can we do to prevent this crash from occurring again. And many, many mainstream American economists like Stiglitz and Krugman are saying that these measures are utterly ludicrous and are not going to do the trick, as are economists in Britain about the austerity measures that the coalition has imposed. Uh, and that we need a different type of a uh, capitalist system, more regulated, in which the state plays a role. And you know, it's very interesting. 
the state which the neo